So, excellent. So I pass you over to Dr. Del Rivera to introduce this month's speaker. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Robinson. So I would like, it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, and Dr. Hernandez, Jonathan Hernandez, he's a tenure track investigator at the National Cancer Institute. He's also the chief of surgical oncology section of the NCI, as well as the associate program director of the NCI surgical oncology fellowship program. He's also an associate professor of surgery at the Uniform Service University of the Health Science, as well as clinical professor of surgery of George Washington University. Before that, I forgot to say that he did his uh, uh, doctors of medicine, bachelor of science and doctor of medicine, University of Florida with the highest honor. And then he did his um, uh, residency in general surgery as well in uh, University of South Florida, but, and also did his um, Surgical Oncology Fellowship, as well as another second fellowship on the hepatobiliary um, pancreas surgery as, at Memorial Sloan Catherine Cancer Center. I have to say that uh, Dr. Hernandez has received multiple awards, not only because of the innovative research that he's doing, but also uh, of his clinical excellence as well as teaching. He is a 2021 NIH Distinguished Clinical Teacher Award and he's also the PI of multiple clinical studies uh, for GI malignancies. Um, he has published more than 200 publications and that was in include, include uh, book chapters as well as all the abstracts, oral abstracts that he presented at national and international meetings. Uh, and besides that, it has wonderful to collaborate with Dr. Hernandez and something that I would like to add, he's a compassionate human being, very caring for patients and it's really wonderful to see that. And with that, Dr. Hernandez, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for that um, very kind introduction. I hope you guys can, can hear me okay. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, well, I, said, I think I clicked the wrong button. Okay. Is that is that showing up okay? Does it look like it's in presenter mode? It is. It is. It looks good. You're saying my title slide? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so, um, well, thank, thank you again. I had a very kind introduction. Um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. And, and this, is, this is something that's sort of come about um, through collaborations with multiple people. Um, and we're, we're super excited about it. I'd like to, so I'm going to go through what we're doing, why we're doing it, how I look at this disease. Um, I haven't put all the material on the slides, so I may ad lib as I tend to do when I give talks. And so um, if anyone has any questions or I say something that isn't clear or you'd like me to expand on it or tell you what I'm really thinking, uh, please stop and I'm happy to do that. Um, and so the, I've titled this the title of our um, trial, and this is going to be a window pane of opportunity for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumors to the liver. Uh, sort of a funny title, but I, I, as the talk proceeds, I think you'll understand why I've titled it as such. And so I, I have no personal or professional disclosures, conflicts of interest, given that I'm a federal employee and not allowed to have any money to myself personally in any way, shape, or form. But I do have creatives with several companies, none of which are going to be particularly relevant to this talk. Um, and these are cooperative research and development agreements that bring money into the lab. Um, and the companies are listed there. So I usually play this slide so that everybody sort of understands how I see this and other diseases like it. And so this is a video of a patient with a pancreatic or endocrine tumor. And I as I see this, I think these tumors tend to spread really early on, um, and they seed mostly the liver, but they can seed other places as well. And those are called disseminated tumor cells. And so long as those cells don't grow, the patient has no problem, and they can come along and get an operation to remove the tumor. But those cells have probably landed in various parts of the patient, a given patient's body, probably very early on. And this whole metastatic cascade and the dictation of what what leads to outgrowth and these sort of things is an area of interest of mine and has been for a long time, but not necessarily germane to today's talk. Um, you know, if 
if this person goes along and they do develop overt metastases, a, a scan of some sort of dotatase scan can be obtained and we can delineate where the overt metastases are. And you can see for a patient like this, as I see this scan, this is somebody I have operated on, they, they have very clear lesions in certain places. And so this doesn't, of course, mean they don't have other cells in their liver, but they have stuff we can see. And so somebody like me can come along and sort of chop those out without too much difficulty. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to come back. And for the most part, these tend to come back. And so what we end up sort of, as I, as I like to think about this, we end up playing a war of attrition with people a lot who have stage four disease. Now, every once in a while, we'll get lucky and someone will be cured and they'll be able to walk away from the problem when we're treating them aggressively with surgery and other things. But I think our goal has always got to be continuing to battle for as long as possible and as well as possible. And so I look at things. Almost everything I do, I, I place in the context of a patient um, because I, I sort of look at things, you know, it's, uh, it could be me on the other side of the table. It could be any one of us on the other side of things anytime. I mean, certainly see people younger than I am. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I sort of approach things in that way. And I, what would I want done for me? And what would I do for me? What sort of risk would I take? So I think about things in that way. And so our arsenal to continue fighting includes surgery. Now I sort of fall into this part in ablation. And, and uh, you can get very aggressive with this. I think that's totally fair. You can't have a lot of morbidity, but this stuff can be done without a lot of, uh, in the right hands can be done without a lot of morbidity. Um, you know, um, PRRT and these sort of therapies are coming along and, and people are very much interested in this. I think embolization is a very good way to go, bland embolization. Y90, I have reservations. I think it plays a role. But, you know, on this list, I didn't include chemotherapy. I certainly could have included capecitabine and temozolomide, but I think our therapies are limited. Um, and I think they need to be better. And so part of what I'm going to spend time talking about is how are we going to get there? Um, now, I, I'm just, just to show you sort of a, a scan on somebody, some of the stuff we do here. And so, as you'll see, there are lots of tumors on this, on this scan, if you pay careful attention. And so we're doing these things. We're putting patients through these huge operations. And they're, do, they're doing well for, for by and large, but, but you'd like to be able to get more from it. Um, you'd like to be able to learn more about the disease. Now, here's sort of how a scan looks. I have to catalog this because I'll never remember what I did. So as, as in the operating room, I have Kathleen sort of cataloging everything I do to each of the tumors so that we can understand what the tumor was, you know, the differences potentially and all of this. Scan on the right, you can see the post-op, of course, you can see my, my telltale sign of clips and ablations and all this stuff. I have really beat up this liver. This person did fine, but I, you know, I've beat up this liver to get all these tumors out. But I thought, you know, we, we should be able to learn more. We have to be able to do more from the chopping out these tumors. And so one of the central dogmas is cancer is a genomic disease. Um, and, and the thought would be that mutations in specific genes are the root cause of cancer and indicate the best treatment. But that sort of made sense a while ago. Um, but sort of, we've, and, and certainly everybody sort of bought into this. Um, and then, you, you know, this was from Nature in, in 2020. This was cancerous catalog. Uh, like we were going to be able to fully comprehend the complexities of this disease with, with genomics. And, and I would say, and I'll concede, and I treat patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. For some diseases, this has proven to be quite valuable. For example, the MSI high population of colorectal cancer, we handled them in a totally different way than we ever did. Um, you, you know, there was a study at ASCO, I think this past year, for patients with rectal cancer. Um, and they, if they had MSI high tumor, all of those paid small cohort, but all of them had a complete response to checkpoint inhibition. And those patients were getting radical surgery. And, and, you know, we've identified mutations that are targetable in real ways. So for some diseases, this has worked very well. But for others, it, it hasn't. And I think I would advocate that neuroendocrine tumor falls into one of those diseases where we sort of have fallen short with genomics. You, this almost, look, and this is just to show you the genomics for these tumors almost looks like a scatter. So if I had a plot full of color blocks, and I just dumped it on the screen and let stuff stick. That's almost what this looks like. It's random in nature. 
And if you were going to try and target any one thing, you certainly wouldn't be helping very many people, assuming the targeted therapy worked well. And so we ought to really think about things in a different way. And so, so why has genomic failed for neuroendocrine tumors? And I'll just read here. When science scientists finished sequencing the human genome, the answers to diseases we're supposed to follow, well, six years later, that promise has gone unfulfilled for a lot of stuff. Genetics just isn't useful for predicting who gets sick and why. The blueprint of life, as it turns out, remember, this is blueprints. This doesn't necessarily tell us about transcripts, and it definitely doesn't tell us about protein. The blueprint of life turned out to be an intriguing heart slip. So if you think about that, what I'm telling you is when you do genomics on the, on the, and you sort of get the mutational profile, well, we do this on everybody, and I look at this all the time. And so it, it's almost like this heart slip. And so what do you do with it? What is this? Yeah, I don't know either. Um, and what can we do with that list of mutations? Most of the time, not a whole lot. And so what you have is a, a list of stuff that are not actionable, but largely not actionable. And why is that? Well, this would require a knowledge of how you, you need to understand the signaling networks. And unless we put this together in some way, and I told you exactly how things were to go together, you would just have a part slip. And so we need to understand how the, how the, the signaling works. And that's about protein, protein kinases. And so protein kinases are the wire that carry the current of signaling. Unless we understand how things go together, it becomes very hard to target additional things if the mutations, the blueprints are not gonna tell us what we need to target. And so, for example, like if, if your computer broke down, you would need, it would, be, it would be sent to a repair shop. A card would be plugged into it. We would know exactly where the signaling malformation was and that part would be replaced. That, that isn't what happens in people. Um, we certainly can get the blueprint data. And again, we do this all the time with sequencing, but we don't have the signaling data. We don't understand them. And so why is that? Well, it turns out you can get protein data, but until very recently, you had no context of how to place the data. And so, you know, we had no real Rosetta Stone to decipher how the, what the mass spec data was telling us. So just because a protein is phosphorylated, what does that mean? You certainly can pick any protein you want and look in the literature and it, it will give you potentially varying information about what phosphorylation at that given site means and what, what kinase was actually phosphorylating that site and all these other things. You, you would have to understand all of that. We got, we got a very big piece of the puzzle recently. And, and, with the, and so this enabled us to look at the, at the phosphoproteome in a way that was not possible until very recently. And so, you know, cancer has really focused. We have, as a field, focused on tyrosine kinase. These make up a very small percent of the kinome. Um, most of the kinases fall, this is a kinome tree, most of the kinases fall as, as serine threonine kinases. And so we, and, and just as an example of some very important proteins that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, these are serine threonine kinases. We just haven't been able to decipher this. Um, again, this Rosetta Stone came to us very recently. This was published earlier this year by a collaborator of ours, Mike Yaffe. Now Mike's at MIT. Um, and so what, what Mike and his, his, his colleagues did at MIT was they gave us this, this protein kinase atlas, atlas. And they said, okay, how does this work? So we know that based on the sequence of amino acids around that site of phosphorylation, which proteins are likely to phosphorylate that given protein. This allows you to work backwards with phospho data. So you can develop, you can generate the phospho data, and you can work backwards and identify which proteins were phosphorylating that. You can then put that together into circuits and begin to understand how these tumors that don't appear to be being driven by, by mutations in any way that puts them all together, but we can look at the signaling of each of these tumors. It may reveal similarities among multiple tumors. It may reveal that uh, an individual patients are very dissimilar from one another, but it will. It, uh, I think it stands to reveal many targeting therapeutic opportunities. And so based on this sort of, based on this sort of a, this thought process, based on the way that we can decipher phosphoprotein data, based on the way we can acquire phosphoprotein data. And I, and I will tell you that this has to be done very quickly in the operating room. So we have a team that I just 
when I cut out a tumor, I turn around and give it to them. It's immediately processed. Um, it's then snap frozen and it, a piece of that is sent for frozen section. So I have the pathologist confirm that we have viable tumor and that we haven't picked a dead portion of the tumor. And I'll tell you, you can, you know, for those of us that do this, sometimes the center of these tumors are sort of mushy. Doesn't necessarily mean it's dead. You really got to confirm this with frozen section. So we have exactly what we think we have in that in that uh, liquid nitrogen tank. And then we're able to do this phosphoproteomic because stuff happens really quickly in, in signaling. So we have this approach that I think we're gonna we're going to employ in this in this trial. And we're gonna look at phosphoproteomics. We're going to look at implantable devices, I'll get to in a second, and then we're going to do part of this ex vivo, which is super cool. And so I think we're going to have a three-pronged approach to how we're better going to understand what we can target for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. So how are we going to do this? Why did I call this a window pane of opportunity? Window pane. Why not just a window? Now, a, win a window trial is when you when you give somebody a drug for a small short period of time and then you operate on them. So you get to get that tumor and you get to figure out what that drug did. It's not necessarily therapeutic in any real way. You're just looking to see what the drug did. The problem is it's a single drug. You get one time point and um, it's you know very limited. You'd have to operate on a huge number of patients to give all sorts of drugs before you figured stuff out. And you're probably limited to FDA approved agents and, and there's lots of limitations here. But we thought of a, uh, we came up with a workaround and I'm calling this a window pane because there's lots of windows here. And in our window pane, we have 28 opportunities. And so the way we do this is we're able to implant a micro device into these tumors before I operate on these people. And so these patients get this device implanted three to four days before, and you get micro dosing of up to 28 different targeted therapies. At the same time, we will take portions of the tumor without the devices and portions of other tumors, and we'll phospho map everybody. And so, the, and, and, the, and the drugs we've selected, I'll go through them individually, but this will give us context data to interpret the phosphokinome, the phosphoproteomic data, because we'll be inhibiting various pathways with all of these agents, such that we're covering large portions of the phosphoproteome. Let, let me show you. Okay, so for example, I, I'm going to include standard of care. We have to um, I think it's going to be really interesting to, to see how much correlation we get with standard of care agents, but these first several should all look very familiar. But for example, the, you know, and we've gone through some of the RNA-seq data on some of these tumors, and we've picked drugs that we think would be potentially make sense based on some of the, not mutational status, but some of the sequencing data we pulled out of the publicly available data sets. Uh, and so you can see some of these drugs and why we've chosen them. I won't, for, for time's sake, and I don't want to bore anybody, I won't read through everything, but but we've chosen these in a, in a strategic way. Um, and we've chosen, some of them have been chosen for multiple reasons. Some of them have been chosen because of a specific pathway that they cover or a specific part of the of the kinome that's covered by the drug itself. And so, you know, you know for, you know, so, so we have this sort of coverage of the kinome in a non-overlapping way. You probably hold that a certain kinase inhibitor hits a target. That is that that is a, a untruth. That's not accurate. When you look at the kinome profiles of, of publicly available agents, they they hit multiple targets. It's it's actually quite revealing to look at what happens uh, when you give that kinase inhibitor. You don't inhibit one thing. You you probably inhibit fifty to seventy different kinases, and so. Based on that, we've been able to map out coverage so that we cover a lot of different parts of the kinome. Uh, and, and so we've done this in a very strategic way. Now, it's a guess to start out with. I'm not, gonna I'm not showing you the data, but we have started phospho mapping people. We've done this on seven or eight patients on 20 or so tumors. It's actually been very revealing. We have not come up with known targets that we should be looking at. It revealed stuff that was not on anybody's radar. Um, those have not been included in the original set. I'll show you how the trial is going to run. But before I do that, let me let me show you how the device works. So this is a device placed by radiology, again, three to four days before. It microdoses in 28 little chambers. It microdoses these drugs uh, into the surrounding area. Now, I, I should also tell you, we're not limited to kinases here, of course. 
we can include immunotherapy. We can we can do anything we want, essentially. Uh, it's actually quite amazing this has been able to get through the FDA, but uh, I didn't do all the legwork. So I'm not going to take any credit for it, but I'm glad I didn't have to do that. I'm sure this took a decade or so to get through. But anyway, so you, you stick this thing in and it microdoses in the surrounding area and you're able to do, based on cutting out tumor around the device with the device, Dr. Jonas at, at, at Harvard, he's able to sort of um, do drug kinetics and really understand what effect that drug was having. Um, so this is this is what it looks like if you fluorescently label some a drug, and this is uh, sunitinib. And so you know he's able to do a time course, and so all of this stuff has been worked out. Now, the good news is we can interchange drugs if we want, and I'll show you how we're going to do that. So you're able to build a profile of each individual drug, and based on you know what we know the drug actually targets, we can probably narrow things down. And so this is how we thought about doing this. We have to, this has not been done in liver before. It's not been done this way. And so we'll have to do a six patient safety running cohort. And so this is how I saw it starting where we'd start with six peanuts and six small bowel nets. Again, metastatic to liver, I'm not worried about the primary tumor. Uh, we will deal with those surgically, but the liver disease is generally what kills people. And so this is where I wanna focus our time. And so once we deem this safe, we'll add in another four patients to each arm. That'll give us 10 valuable patients. Again, there will be up to six devices in each patient, two per tumor, so we can gauge heterogeneity a bit. And we will, we will pause the trial at this point. We're gonna look at the phospho data. We're gonna look at the drug data. We're gonna put this together and we're gonna hone in on stuff. Uh, and then we don't, in, in this beginning, 10 patients in each arm, 20 patients, it's all FDA approved agents. So I haven't used anything FDA, not, not, not yet, certainly in clinical trials or, or otherwise, but we're gonna break that after the 10, first 20 patients are approved. Now they'll be, they'll be handled individually. Uh, I'm not gonna hold up, let's say we'd see a lot of small bowel nets for some reason. Um, I won't hold up the small bowel net to go on to the second part if the pancreas net hasn't quite approved it yet. And so what we'll do is pause, we will then look at the data and collectively, all the investigators, myself, Dr. Del Rivera, Dr. Yaffe, Ali Jonas at Harvard, we're going to, and then our, our friends at NCAPS, Craig Thomas, we're going to look at this data and we're going to narrow down what we think are kinases of interest. And we will then reselect drugs, including non FDA approved agents. For example, our, pre, our prior work on the, on the phosphoproteome of patients with metastatic small bowel neuroendocrine tumors revealed a kinase uh, CK2 that doesn't have doesn't have a, a FDA approved agent to target it. There's stuff in trials, but we would be able to put this in this device. Um, this this has been possible because of the microdosing scenario. And so we would we would revise what we've been doing to hone in on certain parts of that kinome tree. And the other thing I should tell you is, you know, I, I deal with not only neuroendocrine tumors, but other tumors. And for example, uh, First line therapy for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma is tyrosine kinase inhibitor or, or VEGF inhibition in conjunction with checkpoint. There are certain kinase inhibitors that seem to synergize and work well with immunotherapy. This will be a consideration for us after the first 20 patients are accrued. Should we begin to combine? Certainly certain drugs come up that look like these are the ones that synergize with immunotherapy. That will be on our list. And I think as we hone in on various agents um, that this trial that will unfold will unveil for us, what we would ultimately what we would ultimately do is begin to work sort of to a scenario where we can test this physiologic dosing given to a patient outside of that patient's body. And we've developed a way to do this in the lab by, you know, most patients don't require part of their whole half of their liver being removed with neuroendocrine tumors. It's not a common scenario. So we've developed a way to do this as a single segment. Um, and so this is sort of what the setup looks like. It's a complicated machine, but we're able to keep people's livers alive outside of them with tumor in it. And so this I see as a natural evolution of, okay, here you have this device that gives you this data. You've developed the phosphoprotein data. It gives you all of these pieces of information. Okay, but you know, that doesn't, the drug delivery part of this may not be accurate. And so this is the ultimate test before we take this into patients is I will take part of the liver, keep it alive outside of them, and then we can test these agents. And so we've rebuilt 
basically a body around this around this sort of machine so that we can keep the liver alive. I'll just go through it quickly. This this has arterial and portal pumps so we can maintain human physiology. Um, we have oxygenators. Again, you have to keep the portal oxygen lower, like 70%. You can't jack it all the way up to 100 like you would the artery. The liver really does not like that. We've learned these sort of things as, as an iterative process. We we have the kidneys. We have, we've set up this uh, circuit such that we can uh, have a basically an artificial kidney. So all of these things maintain this liver alive outside of that patient for a period of time. And that time for us is a week. And so you you can give insulin and glucagon. We do this in an automated way. So we've developed we've developed a a software that goes along with this that maintains physiology. I do have people sleeping next to the machine uh, uh, as a sort of disclaimer. They have to sleep next to the machine to keep everything going. But but part of this is is sort of semi automated, I'll say. Um, and then you know we 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 have vasoactive medications. We control the pressure. Everything is maintained as best as it could be inside of that given patient. And so, you know, we give TPN and bile salts and, and all that. We've developed, again, the, the software and hardware components are all integrated so that we can maintain this outside of somebody. And here's an example of somebody we did with a, a neuroendocrine tumor, a small bowel metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. I took out this part of her liver, given the location of the tumor. I have the team working on the back table. They take it down to the lab, you know, and, and this is her a week later. Um, she's, I walked her down to her own liver. But this is the sort of thing, you know, this is obviously obviously a huge effort, right? This is this is not something you can just do. Um, it's a huge effort. And I think it's I see this as an end goal for where that data is going to bring us from that device, that phosphoprotein, narrowing down on drugs, narrowing down on targets. And then this is the final sort of test before we actually take it into people and, and write a trial. But I think I think this is this is a great physiologic way to evaluate, to get close. So it's a stepwise, step up approach to bringing something into trials rather than just guessing and and, and spending time and effort and, and not going anywhere. And so, um, you know, this is just to show you the normal liver was happy. The tumor looked like it did when it was inside of her. And uh, I'll I'll end there. But that's how I, I'm thinking we can move this therapeutic field forward. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'll, I'll take any questions at the time, but that's that's how I think we're going to move this forward fast. Um, I thank you so much, Dr. Hernandez. That was a fantastic lecture and very innovative and very exciting. And I can see even our patients here also, you know, are very excited to learn about this and it could be also practice changing. I do have a question. Um, some of the thyroxine kinase uh, that you mentioned, they have some side effects yep. when it's taken systemically, you know, when it's taken by mouth. So do you expect with this device to have the same side effects? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that? So I'm glad you asked that because it brings up some things I did not talk about. Um, so first, so you would not get any systemic effects from that device if you do something has gone wrong because it's very small. The only way we're able to get away with this is it's microdosing. And so it would be up to a thousand fold less than you would ever give somebody because it just stays in that local area. But I, I think your question does bring up a really, and I didn't I didn't give you this, but just full disclosure, I didn't tell you to ask me this because we didn't have this conversation beforehand. So I, I think it does bring up something really interesting. And so one of the one of the therapies I'm very interested in is this hepatic artery infusion pump. And it makes sense for people with with liver dominant disease whose life limiting, you know, sort of disease is going to be in the liver. The issue with it is it's almost synonymous with a single drug, which is not the way it's supposed to be. And so I, you know, I haven't sort of made this publicly known, but I am working with our pharmacology department to bring agents into that pump that would otherwise not be, you, you couldn't otherwise do. And so there's a lot of another stepwise progression of things that we're doing. First is a lot of these, um, a lot of these targeted therapies are oral. You have to get them solubilized. They're mostly hydrophobic but we have a way of doing that. And then we have to have something with very high first pass effect. So the patient sees no systemic toxicity such that that dose can be really high. And so I, I look at this as like, can we find something that I can then take and use in a hepatic artery infusion pump 
And can we just keep people going for a really, really long time by hitting their liver disease in a way that doesn't hurt them systemically? And almost like, uh, you know, you got to have a tune up for your car every so many miles. You got to come in and get some therapy in your pump every so often. But then you go on doing whatever it is you want to do. Uh, and so I, I this is one part of a multi part plan. I haven't I haven't laid it all out, but but I actually think that that approach, because I don't think it's not fair to subject people to a lot of toxicity if unless we're going to really affect their overall survival. That's my feeling about it. And so, you know, surgery has its, has its you know, morbidity, but it's usually self-limited. People recover from it and then they, you know, they go on. But I, I think about it in those terms. I think we can get something else that we can use in a directed way so there'll be no systemic effects. And because mostly what we're treating is people's liver metastases, this tends to be what limits survival. That's great. Um, that's fantastic. So basically what you're saying is that since it's delivered directly to the liver, you don't expect to have so many systemic side effects. Is that what you're saying by doing this? Because yeah. I think it's important, you know, even for our patients to know that because of one of the concerns, especially with this tyrosine kinase inhibitors is the side effects. But if you are able to find a way, you know, that it could be effective for the tumor at the same time, no experience of the side effects. I think that this could be practice changing. Yes. So I, I, you know, I, I, again, that, that micro device will not go anything to them. Nobody will feel anything, but that's more of a, that's a, that's, that's our way of home, home, homing in on sort of, you know, various parts of the kinome and various drugs, but ultimately this requires us to give patients drugs. And, um, you know, no one wants, you know, I, I see people all the time who, I have no interest in taking Everlimus. They don't want the systemic toxicity. They say it makes them feel terrible and, you know, other things. Now, you have way more experience than, than I do here, uh, Dr. Del Rivero. But, you know, I think the goal would be, at least my goal would be to bring this to them in a way that does not subject them to systemic toxicity. And, and I'll give you an example. When we give fluoxurity and FUDR in the hepatic artery infusion pump for colorectal liver metastasis, Patients don't know whether I give them saline or drugs because they don't have any systemic effects. And so we would like to be able to do the same thing. But to do that, we'd have to find the agent, determine first pass, and do a lot of stuff. But we've got to start with a drug. And so I think this is a multi-step process which helps us identify drugs that we think could be valuable. Yes, that's great, Dr. And there is a couple of questions in the chat. One of them is, when does this trial open? And yes. the second question is, if my mom has an set D2 mutation, mm -hmm. can targeted medication for that mutation be added to the method? I believe, uh, Mr. Peters is also saying that I believe it's a common in renal cancer as well. Uh, you know, uh, let me answer the first part first. So that, that is a multi-team approach, the, the trial. And so we've submitted this for a UO1 grant. Uh, which has intramural and extramural investigators. I think we all collectively feel like this will be funded, whether it's funded right now or as a resubmission. I don't know. I actually feel very good about it. It looks really good. It's cutting edge. And uh, and so we will see. Uh, obviously, the part that I would do, would I don't need money to do it since we're in the intramural program, but the extramural collaborators, you know, you can imagine the work in deciphering the micro device and the uh, and sort of whether whether you saw an effect or not, that's not trivial. And so uh, the the inventor of the de micro device, Ali Jonas, um, you know this this grant will support that part of the work. And then the as it turns out, the phosphoproteomics is not not necessarily trivial. And someone who's very good at this has to do it, uh, particularly if you're going to look at tyrosine kinase. That's you know that's because it's such a small portion of the kinome in general. Uh, it's not that easy to map tyrosine, phos phosphorylated tyrosine. And so we've selected somebody we all trust very well to actually do that part of this for us. And so, you know, these people require extramural, these people need money to do this. And so, um, so I would say if it's funded on first round and we'll know at the end of July, that correct? end of July, uh, we would be open. The trial is written. Uh, we would be open in mm, three months. Yeah, sometime in the fall. I think if it required a resubmission, we would be open in January of 24. Uh, and then the second question, um, 
was was related to a set two mutation. So that I actually think this is super interesting. What what if you have a mutation that has a drug available, and um, could we look at that in the device? Um, yes, we can. I would advocate that we should do this because uh, I I would be very curious about that. Um, I, I, that we could it would probably have to be done off study, but I bet we could do it. And we would probably because it wouldn't be one of those drugs we necessarily included based on everybody's data. At least it may not be. But I would be very curious to see. So I would advocate we did this off study, and I do this for people. I do stuff like this all the time even though people yell at me, um, but I do this all the time where I'll just do it off study because I want to know. And so I would be very curious to see if we put sort of a drug targeting a mutation that I, I would want to know. And so I we could pro probably do that off study. Best fences. I bet Ollie, I, Ollie would do it. Yeah, I probably shouldn't say that. I know I don't want to say that. Okay, fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Ear is asking, would you be welcoming other surgical centers to contribute to this study? That's a good question. Um, doing a multi-institutional study for us is sort of painful. Um, it requires a lot of, it shouldn't be this way, but what I'm gonna tell you is true. It requires so much red tape to be cut. I could probably just accrue these patients and do it all here before we could get it open anywhere else. If I think we were having trouble accruing a certain patient population, which I don't know why I see so many small bowel um, neuroendocrine tumors, maybe not as many pancreas, but let's say we were having a trouble accruing with a pancreas patient, I think we could pick one center. Uh, that would be way easier than multi-center um, to, to start doing this. And maybe that would be Iowa or, I don't know, I, I would let you decide, but you know, a, a, another group that does a lot of these, we could we could probably do it there. But I, I definitely would. This wouldn't be like a cooperative group study where this was done in ten centers or something like that. It would just be it would take years for that to happen. Yeah, it should, and I completely agree with those multi centers studies. It's just take a very long time to you know get it off the ground. I agree. So. But, you know, like you say, I mean, Iowa is an excellent center. They see so many neuroendocrine tumors as well, small bowel and pancreas. Uh, there is a couple of questions, Dr. Hernandez. One is from, uh, well, let's start with Dr. Metzgar. Um, I'm curious about options to evaluate toxicity in the ex vivo liver setup. It's one thing to look at efficacy, while you have the human samples, are you looking at toxicity as well? Maybe you can do that in microdosing as well. Did I say that correctly, uh, Dr. Metzger? Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, I was just thinking of, um, you know, as drugs get developed, of course, folks are always looking at toxicity, but they're looking at toxicity panels and, you know, like in chips or in mice. And so then the you know, pathologist goes through and does all the stuff and, and evaluates various aspects of toxi toxicology. Uh, but since you have these human samples, I was wondering if that was gonna be, could be part of your study as well. Um, yeah, um, I, I think, you know, the only toxicity we could look at would be liver. So if the toxicity were outside, I don't think we would see that. But if it were a liver directed toxicity, for and a lot of drugs have a liver directed toxicity, but I think the question, you know, is a, is an excellent question. It's just, you, you know, what you want to know is what's the dose limiting toxicity and where are you seeing the most problem? Unless it's, that's hard to gauge outside of a whole organism. Sure. That makes sense. And I guess I'm I'm trying to think if, if there's any way to get any more PK data out of your liver that you're pumped, you know, you've went so far, you're going so far to do all this. Yeah. How yeah. can you get any kind of like metabol yeah. metabolism out of there, especially for a new I agent? Yeah, I think we can. We definitely can do that. Um, and we're definitely going to do that. But that's a, I, I think that's a slightly different question than the toxicity one. But we sure. would be able to garnish the PK and, 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 and PD data. Nice. Um, our uh, own Rachel Gunter, Dr. Gunter. <laughs> Dr. Gunter is asking, does the metastatic tumor that received the device has to be a certain minimum size? Yeah, that's a good question. So the device, uh, we're basically going to say a cutoff is about a centimeter to centimeter and a half. What I don't want is, 
interventional radiology to miss and leave this in a place that I got to fish it out. I don't really want that. And so, and there's a, there's also there's a balance. Like you know, the larger tumors tend to have a tend can have a necrotic center, and so we don't want to stick it in the middle. And so I'm going to be in interventional radiology when we do all of these, and I'm going to tell them exactly where to go. Um, and so some tumors are are better for ablation because they're maybe deep location or it's just just difficult. And so some I know will be easier to resect. Uh, obviously, we'll have to place them in the ones that are easier to resect, but. I do think the smaller tumors show some advantage because they're mostly solid. They don't have that necrotic core, but I would say a centimeter to a centimeter half is going to be my minimum sort of cutoff. If anybody has any other question, I do have one more question, Dr. Hernandez. And the question is that uh, for this device that you're discussing, is there is any exclusion in the sense like how about patients that had already received liver-directed therapies like ablation, embolization, um, because as we know, a lot of our neuroendocrine tumor patients, they get that. Yeah. Uh, we know that sometimes over time, those tumors recur, and then you know, that's when we need to consider other options. But I, I just would like to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, I will. I, I, the only people I think I would exclude are people, obviously, if you're not a surgical candidate. If I feel like I'm not going to help you with the operation, I don't know that it's fair for me to do things. Um, but the only people would be people who have a bleeding diathesis where I think that placement of that device would place them at high risk for bleeding. This would be the same population who you probably wouldn't undergo a liver biopsy. I don't think that's a ton of people. I could be wrong, I guess. I don't think that's a ton of people. So I'm not gonna exclude anybody based on prior therapy. No, I don't love operating on patients who've had Y90 because I think it causes significant damage to the liver. Um, but other than that, I'm not going to exclude anybody for any reason. Okay. That's great. Anybody has and, any other questions? Oh, sorry. Dr. Yeah, John. Heidi, I, I, yeah, hi. I just put in a question. So with patients oh, with germline know? germline susceptible syndromes like the MEN1, uh, would these patients be excluded? It sounds like they may not be excluded from this study. I know MEN1 population tends to get uh, excluded from a lot of trials because of their underlying predisposition. And multiplicity of tumors. So that's interesting. Have, you know, I mean, that's a good question. I haven't. Uh, I don't remember how. I don't think we wrote that. Heidi, you and I will have to discuss that whether we think right. that. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you think I should include them? I I think we should absolutely. <laughs> I don't think we should exclude them. And also, I mean, with the other clinical presentations of tumors that they may have, like uh, pituit pituitary tumors or um, primary hyperpara, I don't think that should be an indication to exclude patients. Sometimes what happens is that they may have like two primary tumors, like they may have a gastrinoma, they may have a pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, or they may have a thymoma or metastatic thymic neuroendocrine tumors. But that said, as we discussed with other studies, if the other size of disease, regardless if there is another primary tumor is stable, I feel like, you know, we should definitely address, you know, the liver metastasis. Dr. Josh. But it's kind of, yeah, I was going to say that I think, sorry, I, um, I was going to say that it might be very challenging to tease out which one is the um, primary that's metastatic to the liver though, right? Because you may not know whether it's the non-functional or the functional, like you said, Heidi, right? There are multiple primaries. So, and they, if the patient gets a recurrent tumor, is that arising from, right? The acute, I don't know if, if, in terms of the study, I think I certainly feel that these patients should not get excluded, but I think in terms of meeting your first primary outcomes for the study, I'm not so sure. I guess I guess they would have to be if we saw a biopsy of some tumor, we could say with certainty this was there this was a pancreas neuroendocrine tumor or a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor and not a different tumor that metastasized to the liver. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think they would be yeah. included. Yeah, Alina, as, as long as we have confirmation that it's a neuroendocrine tumor, regardless whether it's pancreas or GI, you know, as long as we have the neuroendocrine tumor confirmation, should be okay. You think so? Okay. Mm. That's good to hear. Yeah. Do you agree, Dr. Hernandez? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we would do it. That might add another layer of, of 
you know, sort of, yeah, that, that might be interesting too. Maybe we could do that off study too and put other stuff in the device we weren't thinking about. Although Kathleen's telling me not to do that. So I, I'll i not, I'll just not tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dr. Metzger. Thank you. Six more months, six more months. Uh, then doctor, uh, so close. Um, so, oh, I mean, in, a, in, in that disclosure, I may have forgotten what I wanted to ask. Um, yeah, so I'm curious as to what kind of, um, uh, I, you know, you get a great presentation that really gets at, I think, you know, why you would be interested in doing this kind of study and, you know, getting established why you're specifically going to be looking at some of these kinases, right? Now, I'm curious as to how, what capability there might be in the context of these studies. So these are you know, very clinically focused to get more into the mechanism of how it might be working. And also, uh, will this lend itself to predict, possibly predict or se segment and or predict which ones will work in a particular patient, right? Or how do you see, and so that's kind of a two-part question. One is looking at mechanism, you know, trying to find those, those wires, right? Which wires matter here? And then the second one has to do with um, if you had that pump set up for an early tumor patient, how would you determine which drugs to put in it? Yeah, so um, those are those are two very good questions. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. And so how, if we did have, you know, the, the, the sort of pump set up and I did have my others about what drugs I wanted to choose to put in that home, how would I go about selecting that? I think I think from a study like this, we're going to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And so because we're going to be collecting a lot of data. Now I've showed you the phosphor data, which is clearly going to correlate with the kinase inhibitors, but we're really going to be doing a lot of things on this, looking for correlation. Um, it may be that in order to select a person, they have to undergo a percutaneous biopsy to send that material off with phosphor mapping. And then they're selected that way. Um, that may be what we have to say. Um, I mean, a, a lot of drugs, based, I mean, you have to have tumor for mutational status most. I mean, a lot of things fall out this way. Um, now, the, the thing about the thing about the phosphoprotein data is cannot be done from paraffin, of course. You have to have fresh and snap fresh sample. And so it's a little, it's a little bit different. But this can this community, as I see you guys, are, are very well organized, and 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 so you advocate for each other and advocate for patients. So, I mean, I think if this is what we ultimately said, I, I don't see it. This would be a huge problem making this happen, you, you know, with such a tight knit community. So I think if that's ultimately what this came down to, that one would require an immediately snap frozen biopsy, and then we could tell you which drug to choose. I, I think that's a small price to pay, to be totally honest. Um, you know, you, people are getting these biopsies anyway. Easy for me to say, right? I'm not having my liver stuff. But but uh, but I but people are having these biopsies anyway for diagnosis. This this would be, you know, you could put one in paraffin and put a separate one into a snap frozen vial, have it sent off, and you'd be mapped in a way. That's not the way people are normally mapped with 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 like. PSO 500 is what we call it, but you know, you, you, you uh, Foundation One does. I mean, a lot of people do these things. It would just be a different way. And if we showed value in that other way, then I don't think there'd be a lot of hesitation to doing it. So I, I don't know what ultimately is going to shake out. You'd like to use, be able to use like paraffin. Let's say, for example, this mutation is always associated with this phospho mapping. That could be true, which would obviate the need for a snap frozen sort of biopsy, but. But I mean, I, I don't know. We're going to be collecting a lot of information, um, but I it may come down to you require having a biopsy snap frozen and sent somewhere who could generate high quality phosphor, phosphor protein data. It, it may be that. And then the second question is about mechanism. This is this is a super interesting question. Um, this is not going to, you know, we will we will get at targets and we will get at drugs that hit said target, but we will not be able to sort of and, and this is a true translational effort um, to bring patients drugs. I often see the other part of this happening where people work on mechanisms for a very long time with no clear path to patients. And so I've envisioned this as being sort of the opposite way. Well, let's figure out what works and then we can figure out why and make it better. 
um, so that that would require reduction biology efforts in, in mouse models and cell lines. And I know those those things are difficult here. Organoids would be a way potentially of doing this. I think you'd want to make sure that whatever your model of choosing is had the same sort of profile as that patient's tumor did. So for example, we use organoids sometimes. We want to make sure those organoids have the same phosphoprotein signature that the patient's tumor did. Otherwise, you're unlikely to get data that's going to tell you exactly what's happening. Uh, so that's sort of how I see this. Wow, Dr. Hernandez was really an amazing talk and a lot of information and a lot of hope for our patients as well. So I'm really excited to continue working with you. Thank you for all you do. Um, I don't know, um, Dr. Gunter and Ms. Robinson, you want to just say anything more? Yeah, I'll just reiterate, you know, a big thank you from the entire foundation for speaking today, Dr. Hernandez. Um, it was an excellent presentation. Um, and then Selena, I'll let you talk about uh, our upcoming Net Chatter events. It just, again, just thank you very much, Dr. Hernandez. It was extremely interesting talk and really good I don't know what the word is, just so excited for the future and your child just sounds so exciting and just, it's amazing. Um, so just to say our next net chatter is on July the 27th, um, same time. Um, you will have the lovely Dr. Gunter. Um, she will be hosting as I'm at my daughter's graduation that day. So <laughs> thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, it's been an amazing meeting. And I just can't thank you enough for giving us your time to give us that talk. Oh, really, absolutely. really, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I promise I'll keep working towards something better for people. Yeah, absolutely. And you're welcome. And please come back again when <laughs> we have more results, especially when your trial is ongoing and we actually have some proper, proper information and results coming out. That would be so interesting. Yeah, I'd love to. So, I'd share the results with you. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.